Welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're diving into one of the most fundamental and honestly, one of the most controversial concepts in all of dentistry, centric relation. For generations, it's been this guiding principle in prosthodontics, but now, well, it's really standing at a clinical crossroads, caught right between decades of established practice and a pretty compelling biological critique. So, is centric relation, or CR as we'll call it, a foundational concept we can't do without? Or is it maybe a flawed dogma we've held onto for too long? You see, for decades, it's been a cornerstone, an essential reference for complex restorative work. But now, a really fierce debate is questioning its very foundation. So here's our game plan. First, we're gonna unpack the debate itself. Then we'll look at the strong arguments for CR as a necessary clinical reference. After that, we'll flip the coin and explore the biological critique that questions its validity. Then we'll see how this all shakes out in the real world, the conflict between diagnostic and therapeutic uses. And finally, we'll ask the big question, what does the future actually hold for centric relation? Okay, let's start at the very beginning. To really get a handle on this controversy, we first have to be crystal clear on what we're even talking about. Because believe it or not, the definition itself is right at the heart of this whole debate. So, the current official definition from the Glossary of Prostodontic Terms describes CR as a very specific relationship between the jaw and the skull. Now, the key here, and this is super important, is that it's defined independently of any tooth contact. This is what's supposed to make it such a reliable, repeatable reference point for us as clinicians. You know, a place to build from when a patient's natural bite is just a mess. What's really fascinating, though, is that this definition has not been set in stone. Not at all. I mean, look at this timeline. It's evolved significantly. Back in the 50s, CR was defined as the most retruded or rearmost position possible. But over the decades, that point has literally migrated forward and upward to the anterior superior position we talk about today. This constant shifting, yeah, that's exactly where the controversy really kicks off. All right, let's dig into the first side of this debate, the really strong argument for why centric relation is and has been considered an absolutely essential clinical tool. From a purely practical view, CR is a problem solver. Just imagine you've got a patient whose bite, their maximum intercuspation is unstable. Maybe it's been destroyed by wear, or you just have to do a complete overhaul. As a clinician, you need a stable, repeatable position to build the entire restoration from. And for its proponents, centric relation is that essential reference point. It's the starting line. And you can see how useful CR has been just by looking at all the different techniques we've developed to record it. Things like bimanual manipulation, chin point guidance, using a leaf gauge. These are all designed to do one thing, deprogram the patient's muscles and guide that mandible into this one specific repeatable position. The very fact that these methods exist and have been refined for decades, well, that really underscores just how integral CR has been to our day-to-day -day practice. Supporters of CR often bring the whole debate back to what's happening in the clinic, back to reality. As Dr. Gary Goldstein points out here, despite all the theoretical squabbling, there is just a lack of compelling clinical studies showing that restoring patients in CR actually leads to failure. The argument is super pragmatic. In the real world, it works. And this clinical confidence isn't just a niche thing, it's widespread. In a survey of specialists in the Academy of Prostodonics, a staggering 95% said they would use centric relation as the reference position for a full mouth reconstruction. 95%, that's about as powerful a consensus as you can get. But that clinical consensus doesn't mean the concept is bulletproof. On the other side of this debate, there's a growing biological critique that questions the very foundation of CR. It suggests that maybe its clinical success isn't because we found some ideal position, but rather it's just due to the incredible adaptability of the human body. And this is the crucial distinction we have to make. Is centric relation just a convenient starting point for us in the clinic, or does it represent a truly ideal biological state? The critics argue pretty forcefully that while it might be a useful tool for treatment, using it to diagnose a problem, well, that's just not supported by the scientific evidence. This really pits the old-school nathological ideal against what we now see as biological reality. The old view was always looking for a single perfect condylar position for perfect health. But modern imaging, things like MRI and CBCT, tells a completely different story. We're seeing huge anatomical variation in perfectly healthy joints. And when you actually compare different CR recording techniques, the differences in where the condyle ends up are tiny. We're talking tenths of a millimeter. 
On top of that, a core mechanical idea in the official CR definition, this notion that the jaw can do a pure hinge-like rotation right at the condyle, has been challenged anatomically. This terminal hinge axis was a foundational idea because it made it simple to transfer everything to an articulator, but research shows the mandible is always rotating around a point somewhere in the ramus, not just purely at the condyle. This kind of pulls the rug out from under one of the key mechanical assumptions CR was built on. This leads critics to argue that the whole diagnostic use of CR creates this cycle of circular reasoning. As Dr. Danielle Menfordini and his colleagues put it, you use a technique based on an ideal position, and then you call it a success when the instrument that was designed for that very purpose tells you you've achieved it. Basically, you're using the diagnostic tools to find a problem that only those same tools can confirm you've fixed. So this brings us to what's really the core of the modern way of thinking about this. It requires us to separate how centric relation is being used. It's really a tale of two very different concepts. Let's break this down. On one hand, using CR as a diagnostic tool is now pretty much unsupported. That old idea that a slide between the CR position and a patient's natural bite is a risk factor for something like TMD, that has been widely refuted by the evidence. But on the other hand, it's therapeutic use as a practical technical starting point that's still considered incredibly valuable, especially in those really complex cases where the original bite is gone or has to be totally changed. So you have this deep divide, right? An abandoned diagnostic role and a surviving therapeutic role. It kind of raises a fundamental question. Is the term centric relation itself, with all of its historical baggage, still even fit for purpose? I mean, think about it. The term centric relation is so loaded with historical baggage and these unproven biological assumptions. Because of that, some researchers and clinicians are starting to suggest that maybe it's just time for a change. A new name could help us finally separate its practical use from its controversial past. And one really compelling proposal is this term, maxillomandibular utility position. Honestly, this name is brilliant in its simplicity. It just strips away all those biological claims of centricity or idealness and reframes the whole concept based on what it actually does. It's not about finding some perfect anatomical state, it's about adapting a practical utilitarian jaw relationship for a specific treatment. And that's a definition that both proponents and critics can pretty much agree on. Ultimately, this entire debate forces us, as clinicians, to take a step back and think about our foundational goals. What's the objective here? Are we chasing a theoretical and maybe even unprovable biological ideal? Or is it about mastering a reliable, repeatable clinical technique that has a long, long history of successfully serving our patients? How our profession answers that question? That's what's gonna define the future of this cornerstone concept in prostodontics.